Thank you for joining me for session six in the Lifeway study of First and Second Thessalonians. The title of this lesson is Promised. The text is First Thessalonians chapter four, verse thirteen through eighteen. And the lesson summary statement is the promised return of Christ gives believers hope when grieving. It's a great lesson. I know your class is going to enjoy it. I might mention to you that sometimes in your weeks, uh, they go crazy and there are difficulties. And one of the things that has happened to me this week is things like that. And what I have found helpful are past lessons and I keep record of those, and so I've pulled from the past to help me put this lesson together. And I just want to encourage you to keep these books and file them away. They build a great Bible library for you, but then someday you may be able to go back and pull from them just in your regular preparation, but particularly if you have a very full and stressful week. Now, the way I'm wanting to start the lesson is I put various punctuation symbols on the board uh, for the class to see as they're coming in. There's a question mark and a semicolon, a colon, a period, an exclamation mark, a comma, uh, a, a apostrophe, and a hyphen, and uh, just for them to see that. And then when it's time to start the lesson, I'm going to ask someone to read the paragraph that starts their Sunday school lesson on page 55, and it talks about the difference between a comma and a period. And again, it's just another opportunity for me to help them see the value of that quarterly, that uh, personal study guide, and to be using it and preparing for the Sunday school class. And then I would ask, then I'm going to ask them the question that's in your leader's guide. How would you describe the spirit of the last funeral you attended? Did most treat the death as a period or as a comma? And there will be some interesting conversations. I'm sure you've been to funerals that were definitely Christian funerals and those that were not. And the, the difference between those two funerals is amazingly different and stark. Well, today's lesson <clears throat> provides hope for grieving believers by focusing on the promised return of Christ. Now, our lesson is about three assurances believers have because Jesus promised He would return. A promise is only as trustworthy as its source, and our source is the Lord Jesus Christ who came from the dead. So the first assurance is the word hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 14. Every time you come across the word hope in the New Testament, you can write out in the margin, utter certainty. <clears throat> it's not a wish. It's not a desire. It is confidence. It is assurance. It is utter certainty. And so I'm going to ask the class if someone can give us the context of why Paul taught on this subject to the Thessalonians in the return of Christ. And that is uh, described for them in page 56. Again, you may want to have someone read through that or summarize that. And again, it's another point of helping them see the value of their personal study guide and, and reading it and preparing for the Sunday school class. So after the context is given, I'm going to say, according to verse 13, what does Paul say is the cause of their lack of comfort or hope? And what I'm looking for is just right there at the very beginning. We do not want you to be uninformed. They, there's something that's missing in their understanding about uh, what happens after the dead. Uh, those who are in Christ die. And Paul wants to fill in the blanks there. Now, uh, Christians live ineffective lives if they're ignorant of the great truths of the Christian life. And we see that played out in this incident when they're uninformed about the second coming and what happens to the dead in Christ. But what's the outcome of a Christian if he's not sure of his salvation, if he's uninformed about the assurances of his salvation? What's the outcome in a Christian's life? And I'd like to ask the class to discuss that in terms of a Christian not having assurance of salvation. What if they're, secondly, uninformed about prayer? What 
is the outcome for a Christian when it comes to that. This is his greatest source of power, and he doesn't know how to get in touch and relate to God. So, moving on. Here is an uninformed faith, and it causes them to grieve without hope. Have you known anyone to grieve like this? Grieve without hope. Many years ago, there was a program on uh, PBS, and it was uh, describing about some the work that was happening in China in terms of the changing of the society. It took us to a large city named Kunming, and it told the story of a boy who had two other boys steal his bicycle, and in stealing his bicycle, he was accidentally killed. They found the young men who took the bicycles. They were punished. But there's a scene that I'll never forget. It's, it's uh, picturing the city off in the distance. And then you could hear the mother of this boy who died crying out and weeping. And it gave the translation of what she was saying. And she was crying over and over, My son, come back to me. My son, come back to me. It was the most heart-wrenching of thing I have seen about grief. And what was so sad is this woman didn't have the hope that one day, though her son was never come back to her, she could have the hope of one day going to her son. And for me, as a Christian, it just helped me to understand how very important it is we get this message out. And how very important it is for Christians to understand what happens to those who've died before the Lord's return. So verse 13 is about uh, the response of people who are uninformed. According to verse 14, our present hope is based on a certain event in the past. And what is the event that verse 14 points out? And of course, it's talking about the resurrection. Now you'll notice in verse 14 that he uses the name Jesus. Now, there's a reason why Paul would use that name instead of Christ or the Lord Jesus or something like that. What do you suppose Paul is wanting to do? What is he wanting to convey when he just uses the word Jesus in verse 14? Well, that is typically the word that's used when the Bible writers want to emphasize the humanity of Jesus. And so here is Jesus as a human being. And he has identified with us in every way that without sin. And so he has experienced death just as their loved ones have experienced death. Just as time goes on and Christ delays, we will experience death. Jesus has experienced what we have experienced. And what Jesus did is he trusted that God would perform a work that only God can do. And that is to bring the dead back to life. He raised Jesus... And so He will also raise us. Now what's the event that will happen in the future according to the the last part of verse 14? God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep. What is He talking about there? Well, He's talking about the return of Jesus. Because of the certainty of the resurrection, Christians have hope uh, during times of grief. And the Bible uses many metaphors to help us understand how this certainty of Christ's return and the certainty of our salvation strengthens us. So I'm going to ask the class to look up some verses. Uh, One of the verses I want them to look up is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. And that passage talks about hope being an anchor. And so I'm going to say the Bible uses metaphors, uh, figures of speech, to help us understand these great truths of the Christian faith. And so what is it that the Bible is trying to say that our hope, our Christian hope, is like an anchor? What's the purpose of an anchor? Well, it's to keep the boat from drifting away. And Christian hope, when it's truly understood, helps to uh, keep us firmly fixed in our commitment to Jesus Christ. People who lose hope also leave their commitments. If someone loses hope about their marriage, they'll leave their marriage. If someone uh, loses hope 
about a diet or a habit or any of those kinds of things, if they lose hope of the, of the conclusion of that being successful, they will quit. And what Christian hope does is it gives us this firm commitment that helps us remain true and fixed in our commitment to Christ. Another passage is Hosea chapter 2, verse 15. I want someone to look that up and read that. And it talks about hope being a door. So how does what is the Bible writers trying to convey when they said our hope is like a door? Well, a door is what gives us, allows us to exit a room. And what hope uh, does, it helps us always feel as there's a way out. If you take away someone's hope, they it's, it's in a sense like being placed in a room in which there is no door. The dear people who take their own lives in suicide have come to a point where they have lost hope. They see no way out of whatever the troubles that they may be in. Uh, people who are involved in other destructive behaviors, maybe they have lost hope and they see no way of seeing improvement. What Christian hope does, it's like a door. It allows us to exit. It gives us a way out. A third passage is in this book is First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. And there it talks about hope being a helmet. So what is the Bible writer wanting to say when he said we put on the helmet of salvation? Well, obviously, the, the helmet in that day was used in a military context, and it was a sign of protection. And so hope strengthens us against the influences that would weaken our trust in God. So as you can see, hope is critical to living the Christian life. And anything that assures your hope, your confidence in Christ, is something that strengthens your Christian life. So the first assurance is hope. The second assurance that we have is the return, the return of Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 through 16. Now, verse 15 is the main point that Paul is addressing the Thessalonians. So, how would you summarize what Paul is saying to these Thessalonians? What is it he's wanting to say? And, and there's a number of things that way it could be stated, but this is not speculation. This is will happen. Jesus revealed this to men. And the reason we believe in the second coming being true is because Jesus said so. Jesus is going to return. And those who are still alive will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So I just uh, teach them one of the methods of doing Bible study is taking a passage and summarizing it and putting it in their own words. And so that's what you're wanting to do here, helping to put this in their own words. Verse 16 describes the return of Jesus. And just some things about verse 16. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Just some observations. One, is it's Jesus that returns personally and not a representative. It is the Lord Himself, it says. Notice it's not a secret. There are three things that are mentioned here. There is a shout, which is used as a military command uh, to subordinates. There is the angel's voice, which means the heavenly hosts are going to be included in this. And then there is the trumpet of God. And many times, trumpets were not necessarily used for music as much as they were used for calling an assembly and getting people's attention. And you can read in your quarterly, that, or your leader's guide, where they say, is this talking about three separate things? Or is it just simply three different ways of saying the same thing? And the same, and one of the things they're saying is this, is this will not be a secret. People will know when Jesus returns. And there is the resurrection of the dead. Paul is wanting to under, Thessalonians to understand there is no possibility that they'll be left out. So I'm, I'm wanting to explore the class's understanding of those things, to notice those things when I ask them to describe the return of Jesus. And that gives me an opportunity to maybe add to some of the commentary that they have. When President Eisenhower... Uh, was in office, 
uh, one summer in August, he vacationed in Denver. And he learned while he was there that there was a six-year-old boy by the name of Paul Haley who had an incurable cancer. And the number one thing that the pre this little boy wanted to see in his young life and before it was over was the President of the United States. So one Sunday morning in his black limousine and the flags flying, President Eisenhower came to this little boy's home unannounced. He walked up to the door and he knocked on the door. And the father came to the door, uh, Donald Haley. He came dressed in blue jeans and a dirty shirt and a day's growth of beard on his face. And he opened the door and he didn't recognize the president immediately. He said, may I help you? And uh, President Eisenhower said, is this where Paul Haley lives? And he said, yes. And he said, well, I'm the president and I would like to speak to him. And you can imagine what uh, the, the father must have been. And so he stepped out and behind him was his little six-year-old boy. And President Eisenhower took him out to the car and showed him the limousine and spent some time with him. And then before he left, he, he gave him a hug. He fulfilled that little boy's wish. Now you can imagine the neighborhood, how excited the neighbors were that the President of the United States had come to their neighborhood. Everybody was excited except for one person, and that happened to be Donald Haley, the father of the little boy. He said, I can't believe that when the president arrived, the way that I was dressed, and I didn't recognize him at first. If I had only known he was coming, I would have been prepared for him. Well, this passage is saying he is coming, and we will know it but we don't know it until He does arrive. And so the important thing is to be ready. So there is the assurance of hope. There's the assurance of the return of Christ. And then thirdly, there's the assurance of reunion in verses 17 through 18. And, and I just simply want to go through these things and describe these things and ask the class what their personal study guide had said about this. For example, 17. Then, after those events mentioned earlier, then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we will always be with the Lord. Your commentary talks about this phrase, caught up, that it is uh, the Latin word rapture from where we get our word for that. And it gives you some examples of where that's used in the New Testament. It says we'll meet him in the clouds, and clouds are oftentimes used as pictures of the presence of God. Uh, the clouds descended on Mount Sinai when Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments. There was the pillar of cloud during the day when the children of Israel were uh, in the wilderness. Uh, there was the cloud that descended when Jesus is on the mountain of transfiguration. Clouds uh, are used to describe the receiving Jesus at His ascension, and then He's coming back in the clouds. And all of that is a powerful imagery to talk about the presence of God. This was a society that never even saw a balloon float in the air. And so they were just unreachable. The other thing about the clouds is notice it says, meet the Lord in the air. In the first century, they understood that the air was the domain of the devil. And for Jesus to come back in the air was to show that he was triumphant over the evil forces of the enemy. And it says, so they will always be with the Lord. Now, you're t let's say you're there with Paul. How would you explain to those Thessalonians what this last phrase means? We will always be with the Lord just so that they're informed about what happens after the resurrection of the living and the dead to join the Christ in there. What happens when we're forever with the Lord? It's glorious, glorious truth. Something that I think the class would find to be joyful just to rehearse with one another. Now to close the lesson, I'm going to say to my class, uh, this Monday... Uh, I'm preaching a funeral for a family member. And in front of me will be my family and friends. And many of them are believers. The person I'm doing it for is a believer. 
Uh, but I will have family members that are not believers. They're not Christians. And we'll have friends that are there who are not Christians. And so I want you to help me write my funeral sermon. Based on what Paul has taught the Thessalonians, what do you, what would you say to comfort and encourage those who are Christians, who are sitting there and they're grieving the loss of this family member? What is it that you're going to say? to them that would be of help and of comfort to them. And then on the other side, what is it that you're going to say to those who are without Christ to encourage them and appeal to them to receive Christ as this loved one has that gives us so much hope for being reunited with them one day with the Lord. It's a wonderful lesson, a word of encouragement and it also reminds us that one of the works, one of the most powerful works of the church is the church is to be a fellowship of encouragement. And this is one of the great truths of encouragement.